The first station. Jesus is condemned to death. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. As soon as it was morning, the chief priests with the elders and scribes and the whole council held a consultation, and they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him to Pilate. And they all condemned him and said, He deserves to die. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Then he handed Jesus over to them to be crucified. Mindful of the God alive in me, I tremble at Pilate's words. How did I come to this place of utter failure? I know that God is here present, even at this awful moment of condemnation. I want to escape, but I know that is not possible. I weep for all who are sentenced to die. The baby whose mother chooses abortion. The soldiers, mothers, fathers, and children when governments choose war. The guilty and innocent when the state chooses the death penalty. God did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. Grateful for those who have the courage to choose life in all circumstances. We remember that we live in God. We invite the Spirit to guide our decisions and challenge our hearts. Let us pray for those who challenge you to choose life. Let us pray. Almighty God, whose most dear son went not up to joy, but first he suffered pain and entered not into glory before he was crucified. Mercifully grant that we, walking in the way of the cross, may find it none other than the way of life and peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Son, our Lord. Amen. Holy God, holy and mighty, Holy Immortal One, have mercy upon us. Here's our brief reflection on the first station. Jesus is condemned to death. It begins with these words, As soon as it was morning, the chief priests, elders, and scribes could hardly wait to continue what they had begun the night before. And nothing short of Jesus' death would satisfy them but they needed the sanction of the Roman governor Pilate to condemn Jesus to death. And so they brought Jesus bound and with a string of trumped up charges before Pilate early in the morning for trial, demanding the death sentence. He deserves to die, they said. But as we look at their efforts, the efforts of this unholy alliance, who is really on trial here? I suggest it's Judas, the religious authorities, and it's Pilate. Judas, because he betrayed his master for 30 pieces of silver. Some people suggest that Judas really intended to put Jesus into demonstrating his messianic power so that he might set things right for the people, overthrowing the cruel Roman occupiers, the corrupt religious establishment and truly establishing immediately God's kingdom. If indeed they are correct, then Judas stands accused of both greed and folly. The religious leaders and the members of the council were protecting their own interests. Their real problem was that Jesus was undermining their influence with the common people. They will have seen themselves becoming irrelevant. And Pilate, he was only interested in keeping things quiet in his part of this, in this territory where he was the governor. He didn't want the unwanted scrutiny of the Roman bosses who might remove him if they were dissatisfied because of any disturb unnecessary disturbances. 
So he was prepared to sacrifice Jesus. It was a small price for him to pay in his own self-interest. So it's all about self-interest here, whether it's Judas, the religious leaders, and Pilate. It was their self-interest that was paramount for them. Ironically, (laughs) despite all their plans and conspiracies, they were actually furthering God's will. (laughs) And that's an interesting point. Today we need to ask ourselves if anything has really changed. Jesus was sacrificed on the altar of self-interest of these people. And are we any different? Is it any different with us? Or have we continued to sideline Jesus, rejecting him, putting him to death all over again because of our our own self-interests? We listen to the hymn, Guide Me, O Thou Great Redeemer. Guide me, O Thou Great Redeemer, Pilgrim through this barren land I am weak, but thou art mighty Hold me with thy powerful hand Bread of heaven, bread of heaven Feed me now and evermore Feed me now and evermore Open now the crystal fountain whence the healing streams that flow let the fire recall the pillar lead me all thy journey through strong deliver strong deliver feed me be thou still my strength and shield be thou still my strength and shield When I tread the verge of Jordan Bid my anxious fear subside Death of death and hell's destruction Land me safe on Canaan's side Songs and praises, songs and praises I will ever give to thee I will ever give to thee The second station Jesus takes up his cross We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. Jesus went out bearing his own cross to the place called the Skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. Like a lamb he was led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearer is mute, so he opened not his mouth. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Life has tested me in many ways. I feel my strength being drained from me. I am not sure I can continue. I know the pain of losing my friends. I mourn for those who know weakness and ill health and the sadness of loneliness and old age. Too often, people blame my God for their sufferings. They think that the God who loves them also sends them crosses to bear. They fail to see that my God is our God. He is here with us, embracing us and helping us grow. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all, For the transgressions of my people was he stricken. Remembering the sacred presence, we believe even though we do not see. We carry burdens, trusting that the divine breath within gives us power and strength. In silence, pray for those who are carrying heavy burdens at this time. Let us pray. Almighty God, whose beloved Son willingly endured the agony and shame of the cross for our redemption, 
Give us courage to take up our cross and follow him, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. The second station. Jesus accepts his cross. Having been judged as blasphemous and criminal by earthly powers, both the religious and political, Jesus accepts his cross. Although the judges did not know it, their guilty verdict was a true one, not because Jesus himself as an individual was guilty, but because he was guilty by association. His association and identification with all humanity, all humans, sinners, were guilty of a shameful death. So although it should have been our cross, he accepted it as his, with all its pain, shame, guilt, and suffering. He paid for our sins so that we might go free. Jesus accepting his cross has great meaning for us. In Luke 23, 9.23, Jesus said, If any want to come become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. What does this mean for us? Jesus, having taken our cross and died for our sins, what cross is then left for us? Certainly, we need not again suffer for our own sins. Christ's cross has declared us innocent, free from God's judgment. Since Christ took our cross, what then is our cross? Our cross is the acceptance of a death sentence from the world for choosing to be like Christ. Now, how do we accept Christ's cross? What is the process? Luke 9.23 says, first, we deny ourselves. We recognize that like Christ, we have a legitimate right to freely live as we choose, to do as we please, according to our own standards and our own rules. Christ's cross brought us that freedom. However, like Christ did, we too must deny ourselves that legitimate right to do with our lives as we please. Rather, like Christ, we should desire and choose to do only what our Heavenly Father desires. Secondly, we must take up our cross. Our cross is the judgment of the world upon us for living exactly as God asks. The world considers God's will as disruptive, therefore doing God's will puts us in opposition to the world. Doing God's will is a death sentence. Speaking truth to power is a death sentence. Thirdly, we must follow Christ, his mission, and his method. God's mission even onto the ultimate sacrifice, is that we give our lives to rescue as many persons as we can who are trapped within the world's hedonic mindset. And Christ's method is the way of love. The way of love, righteousness, and peace. So, truly accepting Christ's cross means accepting the world's condemnation. Him one four seven. When I survey the wondrous cross, when I survey the Oh
The third station. Jesus falls for the first time. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. Christ Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, and was born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. I tried so hard to continue, but I could not go on. My heart is broken. I fail to convince people that God loved them. I understand when disappointment and frustration disturb your soul. I understand why you feel like quitting. Remember that you live and move in God. Whenever you feel defeated, I am with you. I will raise you up and we will continue our journey together. Surely he has borne our grief and carried our sorrows. Inspired by Jesus, who trusted in God even when he was crushed by misunderstanding and disbelief, we commit ourselves to remain faithful to the dreams and hopes of the Spirit for our world. In silence, pray for those who are suffering failure, defeat, misunderstanding or disappointment. Let us pray. O oh God, you know us to be set in the midst of so many and great dangers that by reason of the frailty of our nature, we cannot always stand upright. Grant us such strength and protection as may support us in all dangers and carry us through all temptation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Holy God, holy and mighty, Holy Immortal One, have mercy upon us. Now we begin our reflection on the third station. Jesus falls a second time. This third station focuses us on Jesus' attitude. To him was entrusted the task of the redemption of mankind, to save you and I from the death of sin to give his life a ransom for many. The price he had to pay was with his life. But love moved him to the humble obedience that was needed, to the willingness to empty himself, to give up his divine character and take on human form and subject himself to humiliation and the agony of the way of sorrows and to the pain and suffering on the cross. Jesus is committed to doing the Father's will. That is to provide for the salvation of mankind. But here on the road, the Via Dolorosa, the way of sorrows, the road of suffering, the reality of the price of pain and suffering he has to pay is upon him. Can he endure it? What is going through Jesus' mind? Is there doubt? We remember him in the garden of Gethsemane saying to his disciples, Keep awake and pray that you may not come to the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Is he recalling those words now? Is he now in this time of trial? His trust in the Father which produced the obedience to this calling will sustain him in his time of trial and in all the weakness of the flesh. May we be presented, preserved and sustained in our time of trial by our faith and trust in God, 
And may we not be afraid to respond and commit to God's call to us to serve His purposes. Amen. You know, we sing our hymn, which is 119 in our, prep, our hymn book. Lord Jesus, think on me and purge away my sin. From earthborn passion, set me free and make me pure within. Lord Jesus, think on me with many a care oppressed. Let me thy loving servant be, and taste thy promised rest. Lord Jesus, think on me, nor let me go astray. Through darkness and perplexity, point thou the heavenly way. Lord Jesus, think on me. That when the flood is past, I may the eternal brightness see and share thy joy at last. The fourth station. Jesus meets his afflicted mother. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. To what can I liken you? To what can I compare you, O daughter of Jerusalem? What likeness can I use to comfort you, O virgin daughter of Zion? For vast as the sea is your ruin. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. The Lord will be your everlasting light, and your days of mourning shall be ended. I can barely look into the agonized eyes of my mother. I do not want her to see me this way. I know she desires to take my place. Loving and being loved brings suffering to us both. Yet we would not have it any other way. That's how I love you too. I am with you when you cry, when you are in pain, when you feel helpless. A sword will pierce your own soul also and fill your heart with bitter pain. Because Jesus suffered, we know that as his followers, we will not be spared. We pray that his companionship and example will strengthen us as we walk with those we love. In silence, pray for those you love who are suffering pain or loss. Let us pray. O God, who will that in the passion of your Son, a sword of grief should pierce the soul of the Blessed Virgin Mary, his mother, mercifully grant that your Church, having shared with her in his passion, may be made worthy to share in the joys of his resurrection, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. The fourth station. Jesus meets his afflicted mother. The only thing that comes to mind for me looking at this moment is Mary. And I'm assuming she's saying to herself, God's will be done. God's will be done. God's will be done. Thinking back to that moment when the angel first appeared to her. Thinking back to that moment when she first said to, to God how merciful and awesome he is to choose her, a lowly servant. Reminding herself, God's will be done. For he was not just born unto her, but to the world for great purpose. God's will be done. As her heart breaks, as her heart aches, as she's worried and fearful, as she's sad God's will be done. As she feels relief, because soon it will be over, God's will be done. Pain, God's will be done. Fear, fear for, being, for him being tortured, God's will be done. 
maybe even serenity, for she herself cannot control what is to happen, cannot change anything that is going on. God's will be done. A mantra maybe even I should adopt. God's will be done. In my pain, in my sorrow, in my struggle, in my fear. God's will be done. God's will be done. A sign for me, the ultimate surrender. To give up one's life. Yes, Jesus surrendering. But I mean a mother letting go. God's will be done. A mother looking at her child. Raised from small to this age. God's will be done. A sign for me that I too should surrender to God. His will be done. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. A song, a hymn that we sing so lustily all the time. But do we really understand the concept of surrender and letting go and allowing God to? Allowing God's will to be done? A page out of Mary's moment in this Reflection may help us as we remind ourselves in our life's struggles, in our life's trials, God's will be done. The fifth station. The cross is laid on Simon of Cyrene. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. As they led Jesus away, they came upon a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, who was coming in from the country and laid on him the cross to carry it behind Jesus. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I notice that Simon is being coerced into helping me. Nevertheless, I am grateful. As I struggle to continue walking, I notice that his attitude begins to change. My cross seems to become lighter, and I realize that it is because of his effort to carry more of it. When you are not enthusiastic about helping others, I want you to remember that I appreciate the smallest gesture of kindness. I hope that, like Simon, you will discover that service, no matter how minimal, will produce a new joy within you. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Recalling how Simon became a consoling support for Jesus, we are mindful of the gift we can be to others. We marvel that even in our weakest moments, we can be a treasure for someone. In silence, pray for those who serve others, especially those who sacrifice their own comfort to do so. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, whose blessed Son came not to be served but to serve, bless all who following in his steps, give themselves to the service of others, that with wisdom, patience, and courage, they may minister in his name to the suffering, the friendless, and the needy. For the love of him who laid down his life for us, your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. And now for our reflection on the fifth station. The cross is laid on Simon of Cyrene. Who is this man Simon of Cyrene who appears at such a timely moment along the way of sorrows, the Via Dolorosa? He was from distant Cyrene in North Africa. And we can presume that he was in Jerusalem at this time to fulfill what was probably a lifelong dream of a pilgrimage to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. 
he is compelled by the soldiers to carry the cross, under the burden of which Jesus had fallen to the ground. Was he aware of what was going on that day, and knowingly was on the scene out of curiosity? Or was he unknowingly just passing by? Either way, Simon goes down in history as an memorable player in this unfolding drama, the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, through which humanity would be redeemed. The text tells us that Simon was compelled to take up the cross. Did he later, looking into the eyes of the suffering Saviour, soften and made it his mission at whatever cost to himself to relieve the burden on this unfortunate man, Jesus? He was a believer. That's why he was in Jerusalem. Did he have any inkling of the significance of the drama being played out into which he had unwittingly been cast? Did he, in light of later events, understand? I wonder what happened to him afterwards. What a story he would have had to tell. He literally took up the cross of Jesus and followed him. And he felt the pain of its burden upon his back. Have we taken up the cross and followed Jesus? It is an invitation that he has accepted to us. Take up the cross and follow me. An invitation for us to take up some of that heavy burden, even today, of bringing the whole world under his saving embrace. The hymn is number 509. Take up thy cross, the Saviour said. Take up thy cross, the Saviour said, If thou wouldst my disciple be, Deny thyself the world forsake, And humbly follow after me. Take up thy cross, let not its weight Fill thy weak spirit with alarm, his strength shall bear thy spirit up, and brace thy heart and nerve thine arm. Take up thy cross, no heed the shame, nor let thy foolish pride rebel. Thy Lord for thee the cross endured, to save thy soul from death and hell. Take up thy cross then in his strength, and calmly every danger brave. It will guide thee to a better home, and lead to victory o'er the grave. Take up thy cross and follow Christ, nor think till death to lay it down. For only he who bears the cross May hope to wear the glorious crown. To thee, great Lord, the one in three, All praise forevermore ascend. O grant us in a home to see, The heavenly home, The heavenly life that knows no end. The Sixth Station Veronica wipes Jesus' face. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. We have seen him without beauty or majesty, with no looks to attract our eyes. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. His appearance was so marred, beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of the children of men. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that made us whole, and with his stripes we are healed. 
I see the brave Veronica break away from the crowd and come toward me with her towel. She does not care about the whispers or disapproving stares. I see tears in her eyes as she lifts the towel to my face. I praise your compassion when you respond to the suffering around you. I congratulate you when you are strong against those who try to pressure you to abandon your conscience in order to give in to the popular or majority opinion. I applaud you when you stand for truth, even if you must stand alone. Restore us, O Lord God of hosts. Show the light of your countenance, and we shall be saved. We give thanks for those women and men who have been examples of courage when all around them have tried to convince them to compromise their beliefs. We are sorry for the times we have given in to our fears. In silence, pray for those who do the right thing, trusting that their actions will make visible the reign of God. Let us pray. O God, who before the passion of your only begotten Son revealed his glory upon the holy mountain, grant to us that we, beholding by faith the light of his countenance, may be strengthened to bear our cross and be changed into his likeness from glory to glory, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. Jesus suddenly sees a woman come out of the crowd and she wiped with blood and sweat from his face. Now this is the sixth station of the cross. Some of us may know very well how reassuring this may be. Some of us may know, especially at the point in time where we have COVID and a lot of other challenges facing us, how we would appreciate that assurance that we have somebody to come and wipe our faces so that a little bit of kindness can help us to continue moving forward. At this point in time, Jesus was tired. We have to remember that the things we have gone through the night before, the stress, the trial, hunger, betrayal, all these things, and now he has to take our sins upon him and do this task, which he knows is for our good, for the savior of our human race. Now we have to ask ourselves, are we helping others? Are we doing like Veronica and helping others who may be going through trials and tribulations and stresses as they wipe the face of others? Do we help them or are we like the soldiers on the side and those onlookers who are mocking Jesus? We have to remember that we are called to be different. We are called to be strong individuals in the name of Jesus Christ. We are here for Jesus' kingdom. And there are times some of us ourselves may fall prey and need that reassurance. So we are at different times, Veronica, and we are at different times, those who need our faces wiped by Veronica. We have to remember that our situations in life changes us. It could be for the better, but let's pray regardless of what we do. Uh, we are there to comfort each other in our time of needs and our time of joy and our time of love, our time of perseverance. Don't let, it, let, it, let a little trial keep us back. Yes, at present, this worldwide pandemic is scaring us. But we have to trust that we believe in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and that the power of the Holy Spirit will give us that strength and that perseverance to to do what is right. So, let us continue to be our followers of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as we carry our crosses. And even though we do not need to be a priest, we do not need to be a pastor, we do not need to be an apostle, we do not need to be a deacon, we do not need to be a bishop, we do not need to be able to preach long sermons. 
You need to be able to tell people the truth about Jesus Christ and how he touched our lives and our hearts. The seventh station. Jesus falls a second time. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. As I fall again, I am tormented by my failure. Where did I go wrong? Why was I betrayed by one of my own? Will anyone remember what I tried to teach them? When you encounter the rejects of the world, remember that God sees their hearts. I understand why they fall again and again. Some of them have never known love or praise, support or friendship. And I also understand when you fail to be the person you want to be. Never forget that I love you. But as for me, I am a womb and no man, scorned by all and despised by people. Remembering God is present even in our darkness and wrongdoing. We forgive ourselves and others for the harm and injustices done by us and to us. In silence, pray for those who have hurt you and allow God's Spirit to heal you. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, in your tender love for the human race, you sent your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, to take upon him our nature and to suffer death upon the cross, giving us the example of his great humility. Mercifully grant that we may walk in the way of his suffering and also share in his resurrection, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. Now we come to our reflection for, for the seventh station. Jesus falls a second time. So much of what was written centuries earlier in the book of Isaiah and other prophets as well, Christians in retrospect have seen as pointing or foreshadowing Jesus, Messiah King, Savior, whom God would send to set things right, to vindicate and to save his people. This passage from Isaiah 53 verses 48 is no exception. It speaks about the kind of Messiah Jesus was going to be. He is pictured as the suffering servant. He himself said in Mark chapter 10 verse 45, The Son of Man came not to be served but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. On him was to be laid all our burdens, our infirmities and diseases, our transgressions and iniquities. Upon him was to be the punishment that will make us whole. And so we can understand in the passion of Jesus, the fulfillment of what God revealed so long ago to the prophet Isaiah. The heavy burden of physical, mental, and spiritual agony which Jesus had to bear for all our human brokenness is overwhelming. And Jesus falls a second time. Oh, what suffering! But it was all necessary so that in the end, Jesus will be able to fully empathize with us in our times of challenge. 
when we are overcome by the physical, emotional and spiritual burdens that we have to bear. All of life's trials and tribulations. When we turn to Him, He can fully empathize because He would have gone through it all. What a price that Jesus paid so that He could be truly Savior for all of us. That He can give us comfort in our times of need. We can hear that invitation from Jesus. Come unto me, all ye who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Indeed, Jesus was been to it all, it can be a source of rest and comfort to us in all those times when we too fall under the heavy burdens that we are carrying in this earthly life. Now we sing our hymn number 500, I Heard the Voice of Jesus Say. I heard the voice of Jesus say, Come unto me and rest. Lay down, the weary one, lay down, Thy head upon my breast. I came to Jesus as I was, Weary and worn and sad. I found in him a resting place, and he has made me glad. I heard the voice of Jesus say, Behold, I freely give The living water, thirsty one, Stoop down and drink and live. I came to Jesus and I drank Of that life-giving stream. My thirst was quenched, my soul revived, and now I live in him. I heard the voice of Jesus say, I am this dark world's light. Look unto me, thy moon shall rise, and all thy day be bright. I looked to Jesus, and I found in him my star, my sun, and in that light of life I'll walk till traveling days are done. The Eighth Station Jesus meets the woman of Jerusalem. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. There followed after Jesus a great multitude of people, and among them were women who bewailed and lamented him. But Jesus, turning to them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. The men with whom I had shared so much have abandoned me, but these women weep openly for me. Their caring and compassion confirm the truth that we are connected. Pain and sorrow are common bonds. I mourn for them as they long to see the day when we live as brothers and sisters. They realize that in God's reign, we must work together as equals, no one lording power over another. They have believed my message and realize the cost of being faithful to the truth. Those who are sowed with tears will reap with songs of joy. Convinced by the example of Jesus who removed divisions among peoples, we pray to be open to the Spirit's work in everyone. In silence, Pray for those who accept the challenge to speak of our communion with each other. Let us pray. Teach your church, O Lord, to mourn the sins of which it is guilty, 
and to repent and forsake them, that by your pardoning grace, the results of our iniquities may not be visited upon our children and our children's children. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. The Eighth Station Jesus meets the woman of Jerusalem. Luke 23, 28 through 31. In his ministry, Jesus broke with social taboos by ministering to women. Many of them followed him in life, and now here they were, even at his death. Unlike the ravenous, bloodthirsty crowd shouting, Crucify him! Here they were weeping for him. Unlike the disciples who followed from afar off, here these women drew near to him, risking being numbered among the sympathizers. These women, as mothers themselves, must have felt Jesus' mother's pain. They felt deeply hurt and were shedding many sorrowful tears. Ironically, though, it was Jesus who felt sorry for them, and so spoke comfortingly to them, saying, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Oh, what selflessness and compassion in our Savior that even in his own pain he was ministering to that of others. He encouraged them to save their tears for themselves and for their children. For the days are surely coming, he said, when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breast that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us and to the hills, cover us. For if they do this when the wood is green, what will happen when it is, when it is dry? Jesus here warned of a time not long from then when they would see a worse cruelty being meted out upon their own children because the Jews sowed violence, as seen here in the setting up of Jesus' own crucifixion, they were about to reap the rewards of violence. Jerusalem as a whole would experience a massacre, a metaphorical fiery judgment. And if the Romans were doing this to the innocent, non-violent Christ, referred to here as the Greenwood, you can imagine what they will do to those who love violence, when violence would have come to fruition, the dry wood, the generation who chose Barabbas, over Jesus. May we pray that we too be, have Jesus' compassionate heart and choose love over violence. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? The Night Station Jesus Falls a Third Time We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. I am the man who has seen affliction under the rod of his wrath. He has driven and brought me into the darkness without any light. 
He has besieged me and enveloped me with bitterness and tribulation. He has made me dwell in darkness like the dead of a long ago. Do I call and cry for help? He shuts out my prayer. He has made my teeth grind on gravel and made me cower in ashes. Remember, O Lord, my affliction and bitterness, the wormwood and the gall. The soldiers are impatient with me as I fall again. It would be easier to lie here. It would be easier to quit. What good have I accomplished? But somehow I know I must go on. I struggle to stand. I realize I am not alone. Whenever life tests you to the point of giving up, think of me. I will stay with you as you wrestle with doubt, despair, or hopelessness. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its sharers is mute, so he opened not his mouth. Like us, Jesus found strength in God's power in his life. We trust that when all seems lost in our life, we will rely on the same power to enable us to continue walking in faith. In silence, pray for those who may be ready to give in to despair. Let us pray. O oh God, by the passion of your blessed Son, you made an instrument of shameful death to be for us the means of life. Grant us so to glory in the cross of Christ, that we may gladly suffer shame and loss for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. And now we reflect on the ninth station, Jesus falls a third time. We could just imagine the gasp from the lips of those in the crowd who are his followers. For Mary, his mother, and the other Mary, and the other woman, perhaps John as well, is there. The others, where are they? They have sought for their safety. Better safe than sorry, they would have said to themselves. Can Jesus get up again this time? He seems completely spent. And he has not even arrived at Calvary. The soldiers will have to help him and will hold the whip. Or or there will be no one to crucify at Calvary. Jesus has no strength of his own left. He has to depend entirely on God the Father to see him through. We can just imagine his prayer at this time. Father, I have no strength of my own. Give me the strength for I am doing your work. I depend on you. And even as we reflect on Jesus this particular time we learn that lesson for ourselves when we are crushed by the circumstances of our own lives our prayer like that of Jesus should be a prayer to God a prayer give me hope and strength and courage Lord as I recall the passion of your Son, Jesus, my Lord. Teach me dependence, Lord, as even your Son, Jesus, depended on you that he might fulfill the work on the cross that you gave him to do. The thing about it, there is yet more to Jesus' journey for there is still the excruciating pain and suffering on the cross that lies ahead. 
Or will he do it? Not on his own strength, but on God's. Lord, help us to fathom the price of our redemption. And let us not turn away from this precious gift you gave us through your Son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Now we have our hymn number 138. My God, I love thee not because I hope for heaven thereby, nor yet because who love thee not are lost eternally. Thou, O oh my Jesus, thou didst me upon the cross embrace. For me despair the nails and spare, and manifold disgrace, and griefs and torments numberless, and sweat of agony, yea, death itself, and all for me, who was thine enemy. Then why, O oh blessed Jesus Christ, should I not love thee well? Not for the sake of winning heaven, nor of escaping hell. Not from the hope of gaining aught, not seeking a reward. But as thyself has loved me, O ever-loving God. So would I love thee, dearest Lord, and in thy praise will sing. Solely because thou art my God and my most loving King. The Tent Station Jesus is stripped of his garments. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. When they came to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink, mingled with gall, but when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And they divided his garments among them by casting lots. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, they divided my garments among them, they cast lots for my clothing. Not only is the pain excruciating as they pull off my clothes, I am humiliated as the onlookers stare at my nakedness. Some mock me, others sneer, but these, too, are loved by my God. Will they ever understand? When your dignity is attacked and when others try to shame you for your faith, do not worry about your reputation. Do not be concerned when others ridicule your efforts to love both friend and enemy. They gave me oil to eat, and when I am thirsty, they gave me vinegar to drink. Joyful in the freedom that Jesus taught us, we pledge to treat all people as temples of God, treasures in earthen vessels. In silence, Pray for those who suffered disgrace or discrimination because of intolerance, prejudice, or arrogance. Let us pray. Lord God, whose blessed Son or Savior gave his body to be whipped and his face to be spit upon, give us grace to accept joyfully the sufferings of the present time, confident of the glory that shall be revealed. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. The tenth station, a reflection. Jesus is stripped of his garments. How degrading, how embarrassing, how belittling, how crushing of someone's dignity. All for what? Why did he have to go through all of that? For love? If he was a mere criminal, we would understand. If he did something wrong, we would be okay with it. We would say he deserved it. We would say, yes, 
Let him know, teach them a lesson for all who comes after. But Jesus did nothing wrong. He suffered for me, for me, all for love. I wonder if he felt embarrassed, ashamed, ashamed of his body, or more the people who were treating him that way. The people whom he loved so much that he would die for. The people whom he gave up so much. The people who he taught and walked with. The people who abandoned him at the last. Shame for his body or shame for the people. How can I repay him for what he has done? How can you repay him for what he has done? I think that time has passed. We can't give him back anything. But we can pay it forward. Pay it forward. How can I give of myself so much, regardless of the humiliation, regardless of the shame, to help someone else? Because that is what he was doing for us, for them at the time and for us now. That's what he did. Walking that walk of shame and embarrassment. Taking upon himself our shame. Taking upon himself my shame, your shame. Suffering of the broken and the poor and the distressed. Walking that walk so that people will find peace. The only way that I can give that back to him, that you can give that back to him, is by doing it for someone else. Let us pay it forward. Paying it forward is a simple act in doing what Jesus did for us. And we usually sum it up in one of our favorite hymns. Brother, sister, let me serve you. You know, brother, sister, let me serve you. Let me be as Christ to you. Pray that I may have the grace to let you be my servant too. Simple. Pay it forward. Let us serve and love each other the way Christ served and loved us. The 11th station. Jesus is nailed to the cross. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. When they came to the place which is called the skull, there they crucified him, and with him they crucified two criminals, one on the right, the other on the left, and Jesus between them. And the scripture was fulfilled which says, He was numbered with the transgressors. The reality of my dying is confirmed with every explosion of agony as the hammer pounds each nail. I cannot escape. How did I become such a threat to the authorities? Yes, I had crowds listening to me, but I taught them only about a loving God and how to respond to that love by caring for others. Do you find it perplexing that some people like the security of many rules rather than the refuge of a loving God. I think that I upset those who were in charge because I healed on the Sabbath. I allowed a woman to wash my feet. Those in power must have feared that I would take away all their followers. They pierce my hands and my feet. They stare and gloat over me. Because Jesus wanted to free people from fear and work to bring about a new reign of God, they judged him a traitor to their tradition. May we learn to live with confidence in our loving God where we meet unjustified criticism and are wrongly convicted. In silence, pray for those who are silenced for their vision and censored for their pursuit of truth. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you stretched out your arms of love on the hardwood of the cross that everyone might come within the reach of your saving embrace. 
so clothe us in your spirit that we, reaching forth our hands in love, may bring to those who do not know you to the knowledge and love of you, for the honor of your name. Amen. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. The eleventh station, Jesus is nailed to the cross. We adore you, Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. When they came to the place which is called the skull, there they crucified him, and with him they crucified two criminals, one on the right and the other on the left, and Jesus between them. And the scripture was fulfilled which says, He was numbered with transgression, transgressors. The Gospel reading gives no detail as to what actually happened when, when Jesus or so what Jesus endured as he was nailed to the cross, simply that he was crucified between two thieves. The ordeal for Christ was an excruciating one. In all of this, Jesus was not helpless, but he submitted himself to the hammer and the nails. As God, he could not have been powerless. Just as he was able to slip away from his many accusers in the temple, he could have easily avoided the cruelty of the Romans. Yet, in obedience to his father's will, he surrendered himself peacefully so that you and I may be granted eternal life. Unless we face and we realize and understand the viciousness of his sacrifice, we may hardly appreciate the price he paid for our sins. As they stretch out the tired and sore body of Christ on the rough wooden cross, the soldier may have knelt on his hand to keep it in place, then the nails, then the hammer, through each of his, of his hands, and then through his feet, one place on the other. These nails were somewhat square in shape, rough and tapered from the head to the point, so that with each blow of the hammer, it was felt as the bones and flesh expanded, ripped apart over and over to accommodate the increasing size of the metal. The head of the nails was spiked under so they bit into the surface of the object being nailed in order that it was well secured. But the physical pain was not all that our Lord suffered. His emotional pains may have been worse. Betrayed by one of his own, abandoned by most of his disciples, shamed and insulted by spitting, convicted innocently, and taunted by the very ones he was dying to save. No wonder later he cried, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Our Lord endured all of this masterfully. He refused even the gall and the wine intended to null the pain. My dear friends, the cross had no glory, only shame. No thankfulness, only blame. No honor, only disgrace. As we reflect on Jesus being nailed to the cross, let us remember that the pains he bore was the pain of our sins for there was no other good enough to pay the price of sin. He only could unlock the gate of heaven and let us in. And so, my friends, as we reflect on the crucifixion of Christ, let us also be drawn closer to him 
and drawn close to God in thankfulness for the sacrifice he made for us. Let us look to Christ in this time of our tribulation. It is for it is in these times that we sense the closeness of God. We sense the closeness of Christ. Let us try to see the face of Christ in the face of those around us and reach out to them as though we are reaching out to Christ in thankfulness for the suffering he bore. The suffering of Christ as he was brutally nailed to the tree is an example of what he was willing to undergo for the sake of humanity, yes, for you and for me. But what are we willing to undergo for the sake of others? What are we willing to give up so that others may live? As we stay home, let us reflect deeply on how we can become less selfish, less possessive, and become selfless and giving as Christ was for us as he was nailed on the cross. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you stretch out your arms of love on the hard wood of the cross that everyone might come within reach of your saving embrace. So clothe us in your spirit that we, reaching forth our hands of love, may bring those we do not know to the knowledge and love of you for the honor of your name. Amen. The Lord be with you. The twelfth station. Jesus dies on the cross. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing near, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And when Jesus had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And then, crying with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And he bowed his head and handed over his spirit. I look down and see my mother being comforted by John. I hear the convicts on either side of me. The crowd is yelling with satisfaction as they notice that I am suffocating. Oh God, my God, where are you? Why have you abandoned me? I hear the jeers, the mocking and the laughing. All goes dark around me. I forgive. I forgive. I still believe Though all seems lost, I still trust, I am dead. The soldier plunges his sword into my side. Let us pause and reflect in silence. Christ for us became obedient unto death, even that on a cross. Although he was tested by darkness and deprived of God's consolation, Jesus died trusting in God's presence. Because we are the body of Christ, we believe what cannot be seen. We hope for a new life. We forgive what is unforgivable. In silence. Pray for those who are dying at this moment. Let us pray. O oh God, who for our redemption gave your only begotten Son to the death of the cross, and by his glorious resurrection delivered us from the power of our enemy, grant us so to die daily to sin, that we may evermore live with him in the joy of his resurrection, who lives and reigns now and forever. Amen. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. 
the twelfth station jesus dies on the cross luke 23 46 then jesus with a loud voice said father into your hands i commend my spirit having said this he breathed his last jesus was considered an insurrectionist therefore according to the law he had to die he had to die on a cross this death like all such others was supposed to be a human blood sacrifice unto the evil one to the one who loves death the cross therefore was really a sort of pagan altar however God turned the tables on this plan and through Christ the cross was transformed into a symbol of hope for many while humanity in their hearts were participating in evil God allowed it so that humanity can in the act of crucifying Christ unknowingly participate in their own salvation they participated with God in making the ultimate sacrifice for sin Jesus in dying on the cross became the unblemished Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world Jesus Christ was the only one worthy enough to die to take away the sins of all humanity yes even the ones even the sins of the ones who crucified him and for Christ's sacrifice may we be ever truly thankful Jesus keep me near the cross him 133 station the body of Jesus is placed in the arms of his mother we adore you O Christ and we bless you because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world all you who pass by behold and see if there is any sorrow like my sorrow my eyes are spent with weeping my soul is in tumult my heart is poured out in grief because of the downfall of my people do not call me Naomi, which means pleasant. Call me Mara, which means bitter, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. My mother's heart is breaking as she holds my lifeless body on her lap. Her grief numbs her faith that I am alive in God. Her grief does not allow her to rejoice that I am with her. Tears stream from her eyes as her mind replays images from my childhood. As her shoulders begin to tremble with her sobs, I put my arms around her. I will never leave you, I tell her. You will see me again. We will always be together. Her tears run down her cheeks, and she has none to comfort her. Reflecting on the death of Jesus and his mother's sorrow, we gain strength and learn to live again. 
with our wounded hearts, so we discover again how we are one with all who suffer the anguish of loss. In silence, pray for those who are grieving. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, by your death you took away the sting of death. Grant to us, your servants, so to follow in faith where you have led the way, that we may at length fall asleep peacefully in you and wake up in your likeness for your tender mercy's sake. Amen. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. The 13th Station of the Cross The body of Jesus is taken down from the cross. My reflection is taken from the Gospel of John, chapter 19, verses 33 to 34. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. Here ends the reading. Let us now consider how our Lord had died. He is taken down from the cross by two of his disciples, Joseph and Nicodemus, and is placed in his mother's arms. Mary, his mother, who gave birth and loved her child, now must receive her dead child into her arms. What sorrow and anguish she must feel at what has taken place. Jesus is dead. His body hangs from the cross until at last it is taken down. Mary cannot change the events of this day, but she does not shy away in defeat. Although she is in tremendous pain, she holds onto her son. As Jesus' mother, she loved him through it all and wondered the meaning behind each of his previous actions. Now she must continue to ponder and wonder what has happened here today. But she's not alone. A few faithful others gather with her. It is a scene of sorrow and desolation, yet of great peace as well. Mary's grief is our grief. She cradled her son and offers him back to the father. She stands with most parents who have held their child in debt. Mary grieves with all who sorrow for loved ones they have lost. By Mary's example, may we too also learn to do the same, to hold on to Jesus even in our darkest hour. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Ooh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there 
when they nailed him to the tree. Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Ooh, Sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Were you there when he rose up? from the dead were you there when he rose up from the dead oh sometimes it causes me to shout hallelujah were you there when he rose up from the dead? The fourteenth station. Jesus is placed in the tomb. Luke twenty three fifty through fifty three. Jesus is laid in a tomb. Joseph of Arimathea gently wrapped Jesus' naked body in linen and placed it in his own tomb. There were tears of sadness and heartache all around, but to most it was now all over. A tomb is the home of the dead, and Jesus, being quite dead, was placed there. The dead are placed in a tomb and they are expected to remain there and to rot. Our loved ones may live on, but only in our hearts and minds and in the works that maybe they had created. This is what they had expected of Jesus. And Jesus, however, forever re redefined the tomb. For the world, the tomb remains a place for the dead. For Jesus Christ, however, the tomb is a place of re rebirth. It was in the tomb, the place of otherwise ultimate weakness and failure, that Jesus put off his mortality and reclothed himself with immortality. From that moment, because of Jesus Christ, the tomb is for us now to a place in which we shed our own mortality to put on immortality. Christ's tomb then became the church's womb. The tomb became pregnant with the church. All who had died before and will die after, if they would believe in Christ, they will be born again from death unto life. May we, with humble hearts, truly believe and not fear. Sing with me, and can it be? And can it be? his pain for me who him to death pursue amazing love how can it be that thou my God just die for me amazing love 